I, I'll be talking more about weather than climate. Um, although forecasting for dairy systems under climate change, um, the topic actually came up from uh, my colleague, Dan Kirk Davidoff, who I should credit for submitting the abstract coming up with the idea and then deciding that he had some other commitments and therefore I get the great opportunity to come here and I prepared the presentation, but the original was his idea. Um, so first, before I get into everything, I sort of wanted to provide a little motivation, then I want to come back to this at the end more as a question to all of you. So forecasting things for dairy system, we could talk about heat stress and you need to forecast for today or tomorrow, what should I do? Or um, for long-term things, next year, do I need to, or in the coming decades, do I need to buy, create new infrastructure? Um, the, the feed is going to be available, have we had enough rain for the pasture, or should I cut the hay now? Or is it gonna be dry for the next few days? Um, and what about next year, or the next 10 years, or likewise with heavy rain and runoff? Um, so these are possible questions, but you can tell me more about the kind of information that you actually need for decision-making purposes when we get towards the end. Um, so um, we have um, a large suite of observations from satellites, from upper air balloons, from aircraft that provide a lot of crucial uh, data, which is flying along, they take the temperature off the levels as they're flying along, um, surface observations, a whole suite of things. And this goes through um, some very complicated quality control procedures and goes into the models, the Ferraris, as well as the, the pickup trucks um, through um, a very complicated data assimilation process that accounts for the observations and how they differ from the models and trying to keep the structure that was in the models while moving them towards the observations. And then it comes through these models and you get a forecast of the weather. And you do this for a whole bunch of different models and you get different forecasts as we've been talking about. And then you can use all of that and combine it with statistics and give you distributions and you can also calibrate them separately and um, you can do all sorts of fancy things and get a better forecast, but it's still not a perfect forecast. Um, so you can have your weather forecast now and then you can combine that with application related data. For instance, we forecast for wind power and solar power. So if we have a client who has proprietary data and they give us the data of what the system was actually doing, how much power generation was coming out, we can use that um, in our old proprietary model together with the meteorological data that drives it to come up with an application forecast such as the wind power. We can do the same thing with agriculture related products. And then if you combine that with somebody's business model, you have a decision point, a threshold above or below which you need to make a certain, take a certain action. And if you take the wrong action, you have a certain cost. And if you take the right action, there's still a certain cost to taking the action. Then you can come up with decision A's. Um, so, so that basically is what the private weather business does that the public weather business in the United States doesn't do, but in some other country does. So MDA um, started, um, the weather group started in 1974, and in 1988 we started CropCast, which um, was part of EarthSat, which was what the company was called at that time, and we provided daily agricultural commodity forecast. So this was mostly dealing with things like corn and soybean. Um, Energy Weather Services started in 1990, and we've had a variety of things coming down the pike since then. We do we uh, partner with somebody to produce load electric load forecast. Um, um, talks about risk management, and MDA took over in 2010. They're a bigger company, kind of company in Canada. They build all the Canadian spacecraft, um, and they took over a whole bunch of other little companies. They took over us, and we're now part of them. And you now have a, the U.S. part is called NDA Information Systems LLC. And these are some of the people here, some of the people who work for us, and um, that's Dan, so I should point him out. Um, so um, as a sort of proof of concept of what you can do with this sort of uh, paradigm, if we start out with a dairy heat stress index, and you're most of you are probably familiar with the sort of function of temperature and humidity, and we're gonna use this color scale for most of the slides, so the, the blues are all safe and fine, and the yellows are sort of marginal, and the oranges and reds are sort of dangerous, you need to do something. Um, 
and it's a function of the temperature and the dew point, um, but it's plotted as a function of relative humidity, but relative humidity is also a function of temperature and dew point, so you can mathematically relate it this way. Uh, so if you take a model forecast temperature, so this model is the Ferrari that runs at a three kilometer grid spacing, about two miles, and this run runs out only to 15 hours, and it's a forecast for the middle of the day. So you can see your hot temperatures in the valleys and the higher areas and further north is cooler. And up here, it's even much cooler. The cold front, the front is passing through the region in this example. And you can see the lakes are also much cooler. Um, and this is the dew point temperature. So um, this is the temperature. If you cool to this temperature, you would form dew or you'd condense out. You could even you could get fog. Um, so the dew point temperatures are low through here and high through here, and they have less variation than temperature. Um, and so if you combine them, the, well, this is the humidity, relative humidity that corresponds to that. Um, so if you can combine them, you can create your own Gary heat index that is a, combining the model temperature and dew point. Um, but we can do better than that. So if, oh, first of all, this is, if I zoom in on Delaware County here, um, then it looks like this if you go down to the county level. And this is a model, again, that uses three kilometer grid spacing, but it can't actually resolve things at three kilometers because the weather is dynamic. And so by having points every three, grid boxes every three kilometers, it's actually resolving features that are about 15 or 20 kilometers in scale. Um, a little smaller than the size of the county or size of some of the counties. Um, so we have digital elevation map at one kilometer grid spacing, and it looks like this. So you can see the river valleys and streams a little bit uh, cutting through the terrain. And if you make the difference between the one kilometer terrain and the model terrain, it looks like this. And if you zoom in on Delaware County, then you see small scale differences that are real differences in terrain. Um, and if we, make a, if we take the model temperature and then we apply a correction based on altitude with a certain assumption of how much the temperature cools as you go up, then you can get a new Gary heat stress index that's downscaled a little bit down from three kilometers. And it looks like this. Um, and then if you can combine that with some land use data, so MDA has developed from Landsat and other data sources, RapidEye, various data sources. Um, we've developed land use data down to 30 meter resolution. And it, this one was done in 2011. It takes a few years to update. You need to get enough satellite overpasses to have good quality data. Um, so you can then extract which of these 30 meter blocks has possible pasture land where you're not going to have woods or cities or the terrain's not going to be too steep. Um, and you can say that, okay, so this is my dairy heat stress index. It's corrected for elevation and is only in the areas where you might have pasture possible. And then if you zoom in on Delaware County, it looks like that. So you can, and we change the color scale. So this is the same color scale we've been using. Um, but this color scale now, um, so the blues come from 65 to oranges at 75. And you can see there's some local variations. And if you were, well, if you were around here, you might want to see if you could somehow move your cow from this spot to that spot. <laughs> um, so this is just sort of an example of the kind of things you can do with models. Um, so the question is though, how accurate is it? So I don't have any statistics on how accurate the dairy heat stress index diagnostic is, but um, I did some analysis about temperature forecast, and instead of looking at how it, an average measure of the error on a typical day, I divided it into when it was, when the actual temperature was much colder than average compared to much normal, warmer than average. So the different colors are, these are three standard deviations below normal observed conditions versus three standard deviations above normal. So it goes from very cold to very warm compared to normal. And this goes 
This is done seasonally across um, a number of, across one year for 29 different cities across the country. And what you can see is that the error, so also um, these are, I don't remember where you did in here, but this one a couple years ago. Um, all right, so these are um, different lead times. So this is the shortest lead time, and each step is longer lead time after six days. And so you can see obviously the error grows as you go to longer lead time. The error doesn't grow as much when temperature is close to normal. And when temperature is much further away from normal, the errors are biggest, especially when it's cool in summer or warm in winter. Those are the times when we have the biggest problems. But when you're most concerned about is when it's cold in winter or hot in summer, and actually it did pretty well then. Um, so this is a comparison of how we did by taking many different models and combining them compared to each individual model or data source. And um, so where it's positive, it means we improved, and where it's negative, it means um, we were not as good. And I broke it down seasonally, so again, you can see hot in summer and cold in winter. Colors, again, are colder than normal to middle to warmer than normal. And um, compared to most of the different model sources, so this is for later the same day when we made the forecast. We make the forecast early in the morning, then this is that afternoon, for instance, um, or any time later that day. And then what we see is that we, we improve over most of the models um, by making a combined forecast using all of this information. Now this is one day in advance, two days in advance, and some of the models don't forecast out very many days. So by three days, some of them have dropped out because they're not making forecasts out to that time range. Um, but um, what's interesting is that our biggest gains are for hot winter, for hot summer weather especially, which is when you most need it. So we seem to be providing some value added for the most serious conditions. Um, anyway, so um, this is the, if I have the temperature more than two standard deviations colder than normal in winter, and I'll show you the next one is hotter than normal in summer, um, this is the probability of detection for um, our forecast versus each of a bunch of different other data sources, all the other sources. And it's uh, as a function of lead time. So this is same day, next day, out to six days ahead. And so as I said, some of the models drop out after a certain number of days because they're not forecasting out that many days. Um, and then this is the false alarm rate. So some of the models predict, they almost always catch it when it's going to be very cold, but they also predict too many times when it's going to be very cold. It doesn't actually happen. And when you look at there's an index called critical success index that tries to combine these two measures. And um, we do pretty well compared to the other data sources um, at all the different lead times for cold winter and even more so for hot summer conditions where it's at least two standard deviations above normal in summertime. So um, that's the gist of what I wanted to show in terms of what kinds of things we can creatively create and what, uh, how well can we actually do. Um, so there's some other kinds of products that MGA produces. We produce um, CropCast. Um, where we take um, weather data and um, try to use that with other information we have to make yield data for crop yield for um, mostly the major uh, grain crops. Um, and we have daily and weekly reports where we um, uh, produce global summaries of what we're seeing in the weather and how that's going to affect um, crop yields and uh, coffee, sugar, cocoa, cotton. Um, a lot of our clients are traders and in, in commodities trading. Um, but because this relates to the price of grains, like if you're planning, well, am I going to need to buy grains for feed at a certain time? Well, how are the prices going to be looking for different possibilities? Um, and we have. Um, monthly hotspots where we uh, focus on certain regions where something 
uh, interesting or unusual is going on that's going to be having an impact on agriculture. Um, we have the production estimates that use um, proprietary crop modeling, um, and um, we have harvest acreage and yield and production in bushels and change from last week's forecast. And then we also um, uh, have maps of the vegetation health index. Um, and we can also present um, any of this kind of data, including weather data, into GIFs um, so that you can then overlay that with other infrastructure or other things in your own systems. Um, so, the, um, so basically, in the private sector, we can produce various kinds of products that are tailored to industries. Um, we have not been involved in dairy yet, but I'm here to learn all about it so that we can partner with you and become involved in dairy. Um, so what I thought I would do is use remaining time to say, well, what are the kinds of actual information needs? Instead of getting a temperature forecast, what would you actually want, or how could we combine various kinds of information? Maybe information you have from your field or something that could be combined to produce something that is a useful decision maker. And also, um, given that we have uncertainty, what range of uncertainty can you work with, and what range of uncertainty makes it lose value? And so that's basically an open question to everybody. Let me ask a question about timing. Um, I could foresee that if you have dairy and you want to move your cows from a place with high yeah. heat index to somewhere lower, you might need a couple days to, to know that. How, how far ahead can you make these forecasts? Um, well, that, that's also related to accuracy, of course. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, we can make them for any amount of lead time, but they may not, the accuracy might not be good enough to be useful after a certain amount of time. Do you think a couple days? That, that um, in cases where there's large scale for, um, factors driving a heat wave, we might be able to do it sometime a week in advance. And if there's a case where there's something local going on or um, um, more maybe the opposite of we were expecting a heat wave, but there were a bunch of thunderstorms came up and it was cloudy never got, uh, it, it never really materialized. So we predicted it was going to be really hot and it wasn't. Um, that kind of thing you might not know until the day before or even the same day. Right, yeah. 